Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you're hearing this, then you're on the public feed, which means you'll get episodes a week after they come out and you'll hear advertisements. You can gain access to the subscriber feed by going to colemanhughes.org and becoming a supporter. This means you'll have access to episodes a week early, you'll never hear ads, and you'll get access to bonus Q&A episodes. You can also support me by liking and subscribing on YouTube and sharing the show with friends and family. As always, thank you so much for your support. My guest today is Michael McCullough. Michael McCullough is a professor of psychology at the University of California, San Diego, where he directs the Evolution and Human Behavior Laboratory. He studies the functions of human behavior and emotion using the conceptual tools of evolutionary psychology and cognitive science. He's conducted research on forgiveness, revenge, gratitude, empathy, religion, and morality. He's the author of Beyond Revenge, The Evolution of the Forgiveness Instinct, and The Kindness of Strangers, How a Selfish Ape Invented a New Moral Code, which is the focus of today's conversation. Michael and I talk about the field of evolutionary psychology and why it's considered controversial. We talk about Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene revolution. We discuss the evolutionary roots of altruism towards strangers. We talk about the criticism that evolutionary psych is a collection of just so stories rather than actual science. We talk about the evolution of welfare spending over the past few centuries. And finally, we talk about how it's possible for human societies filled with selfish apes to become more altruistic. So without further ado, Michael McCullough. Okay, Michael McCullough, thank you so much for coming on my podcast. Thanks for having me, Coleman. So the topic of our conversation today is The Kindness of Strangers, which is your new book. But before we get into that, can you give people a summary of your background and how you came to study the topics that you study? Sure. Uh, my PhD work actually is in counseling psychology. I, I thought what I would spend my life doing is um, learning how to make psychology, give psychology away um, to help people who needed help with um, kind of problems in living, not necessarily that had psychological disorders, but um, adjustment issues, were trying to figure out what they wanted to do with their lives. Um, I was really into Viktor Frankl and uh, existential ways of thinking about psychology and um, really thought that a lot of what people needed was uh, a way to make sense of things that had happened to them in the past and figure out a kind of motivational fuel that would give them coherence and meaning to their lives going forward. So, you know, there's a lot of different approaches to counseling and psychotherapy, but those existentialists really um, uh, got, got my attention. So I thought that's what I would do is kind of develop approaches to psychology that help people to, you know, figure out what their stories were and, you know, build paths for themselves, whether that was in their careers or their relationships or whatever. Um, but in that work, I increasingly got interested uh, in my advisor's research. Uh, and he was interested in religion and he was interested in also in psychotherapy. Um, but one of the things he was writing about was, uh, was forgiveness and how you um, might you help clients to forgive harms as a way of helping them to improve marriage problems or relationship problems or you know, get over bad stuff from their, their pasts. And in our conversations, we realized there just wasn't any research on the topic. There was hardly any research really explicitly about revenge or retaliation, um, but there certainly wasn't anything on forgiveness. And so I got increasingly interested in just as a basic process of human psychology, what does it take to put aside hostility, the desire to avoid, the desire to see harm come to someone who's harmed you in the past. Um, we didn't really have even a good psychological vocabulary for something like that other than sort of healing or moving on. But it seemed to me that reconciliation was really important. Like if you can find ways to help people repair valuable relationships, even that have, even those that have been damaged by, you know, something awful, um, that there might be real benefit 
on a number of levels from that. So I started working on forgiveness straight away. You know, uh, I did my thesis and my dissertation on these topics and just stayed with that as a topic and still work on it. Um, but I got more and more into sort of the pro-social side of human psychology. So studying forgiveness easily led me into an interest in cooperation and altruism. More recently, I've gotten quite interested in how it is we come to trust people and how we lose trust, um, which clearly is related to also forgiveness as well. So I kind of work in this little, little, you know, I guess most of the tricks in my bag have to do with the study of pro-social behavior uh, in the laboratory um, and to the extent that I can also sometimes out in real life. Hmm. Yeah, and in your research and in, in the book, you take the perspective, at least for much of the book, of evolutionary psychology, which is a field that is at the same time very interesting and controversial. So I want to start there because that's where you, you start in the book. Um, can you just give people a basic picture of what evolutionary psychology is and how does it differ from non-evolutionary psychology? Sure. Most of psychology is built around the desire to understand cause and effect. Um, in my part of psychology, Often the way we understand cause and effect is to say there's some variable out there, there's some feature of the world, some characteristic of a social situation you're in that seems to create this effect. So someone insults you, you want to retaliate, or you fume about it, or you say something nasty about it, or you want to harm them. So the the general way you approach this work is to kind of assume there is some event in the world and some response in the world. And so what you're trying to establish to some extent is, you know, is that an effect real? Does, you know, is there this causal link? And then if you can establish that there is one, then you want to sort of say, well, what's going on in the middle to make that effect happen? You know, so someone harms you and you feel resentment or you feel some sort of feeling or you suddenly what comes to memory or other insults from the past that make you even angry or something and then you want to retaliate evolutionary psychology but to but to a large extent what happens when we're thinking about that middle part is we just sort of it's a black box it's this impenetrable black box it's the human head something's going on in there we kind of don't know we wave at it and we assume well you know Somehow the mind is ending up feeling vengeful because of this, this harm that's just happened. Evolutionary psychology, the way I think about it, is an insistence on not black boxing the mind. Mm -hmm. What you actually want to do, even when you're studying social behavior, even when you're studying interpersonal relationships, how people harm each other, help each other, cooperate, uh, you know, undermine each other, whatever it is you're studying, talk to each other, convince each other. We don't want to black box what's going on in the head. Instead, we want to assume that there are active tools in the head, computational mechanisms that natural selection designed to perform specific kinds of jobs that are ultimately doing that work of mediating the relationship between these environmental events, you know, our social lives and the ways we behave in response to the social lives. So natural, uh, pardon me, evolutionary psychology is just psychology. But what we try to do is take very seriously the fact that you don't get the mind for free. You can't, you know, it, it's, it's, not an, it's not a solution to a problem. It's the problem. For psychologists, understanding the cognitive processes that create behavior, is that's the whole game. And... And so we often just sort of say, well, there's clearly something going on, but we want to understand how information from the world is getting processed and producing behavior. And by understanding, you know, input output relationships, trying to make some inferences about how, the ways in which natural selection actually built our minds. 
So we can figure out what is, in a sense, the mind for. If we can figure out what it's good at doing and bad at, at what it's doing, uh, what it's bad at doing, our hope is we can figure out what the functions of all those circuits are, what the functions of all these cognitive processes are. So we're trying to link information processing, you know, the mind as a basically a collection of little computers, with the theory of natural selection to figure out like what are the cool programs in there? What did we evolve to do psychologically and behaviorally? So there's nothing controversial about it really if you take that step back and you just say like, we're just trying to reverse engineer the mind and figure out what kind of circuits are in there. Hmm. And another way of putting it is that it's just evolutionary biology, which is uncontroversial, applied to the brain and the mind, right? That's a exactly right yeah the it the two tools i think that are the most important tools for psychology probably ever are the theory of natural selection and the computational theory of mind or if you like you can call it the information processing theory of mind the theory of natural selection tells us that what evolution produces are really cool tools that enabled populations of organisms to get important work done. And what work was that? That was work that enabled evolving individuals to increase their reproductive success. That's what natural, so natural selection builds cool things. It builds design. The information process, and that, and that applies to minds as well as to bodies. It applies as, you know, to humans as well as to non-human animals. That's how we get structure. That's how we get features in the biological world, including, including the human biological world, that enable us to get interesting jobs done. So we're not just blobs of cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think part of why it's um, controversial is that if you, if you accept evolutionary psychology as a way of thinking, then you have to accept that there is such a thing as human nature. And though, that, though human nature might allow for a, a, a vastly wider spectrum of behaviors than say dog nature that there's there's nevertheless a conversation to be had about how we are programmed at birth right that 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 might put limits on limits that are nevertheless much wider than most animals but limits nonetheless on how you can expect it, human beings and therefore societies to turn out and that becomes controversial whenever it bumps up against politics um, and, and so on and so forth. And your book touches on actually a great deal on that sort of in the later half. Um, but let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the relationship between evolution and selfishness as a concept. We have the just the common notion of selfishness that we use to mark out people that are particularly annoying and selfish and, you know, don't reciprocate and whatnot. But can you talk about the relationship between selfishness in the conversation about the selfish gene and, and evolution and misunderstandings of, uh, that, that, that are commonplace there? Absolutely. The place I think that's really important for people to get to in trying to get the whole evolutionary psychology thing is that the features of our minds and bodies we have that are reliably produced in our species, that, that make every human being the same, that make us identical in every important way. Um, are the are structured the way they are because the genes that produce them, the genes that give rise, you know, genes are just recipe books, as you know, as you know, just recipe books that tell you what to put where across development to build a creature. The genes that had the most salutary effects in creating stuff around them that increase those genes rates of reproduction are the genes that stuck around. So, you know, at the most fundamental level, a what a gene does is it gives a recipe for a protein. You make a protein and you, a gene tells those proteins where to go and where to 
exist in a cell and on what schedule to end up there. Genes that end up doing those things in the right way, you know, that are, that are arranged in the right way and produce an effect over and over across multiple generations, end up building features around themselves like hands or eyes or, you know, a digestive system that is better than the ways they could have built these bodies. And as a result, the bodies that are best at helping those genes to make more copies of themselves in the future are the bodies we end up with. So the reason we have the bodies we have today in a, you know, in a word, in a, in a little, we put a little bow on it, are the bodies that of all the possible bodies that were in competition with each other, with each other were the ones that led to the highest reproductive rates of all of the genes in the population of genes that constitute them. So genes are doing things in the world that raise their own rates of reproduction. Um, they don't have minds. They don't have an agenda. They're not looking forward and saying, gosh, I'd like to have, make more copies of myself. And here's a good way to do that. Obviously, they don't have a you know, forward-thinking agenda. But the way they operate through time makes it look as if they have these agendas because they build things that are cool. They build things that are effective at enabling them to push themselves out into the gener to generations in the future. So it's in that sense that the famous evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins introduced in 1976 in his book, The Selfish Gene, the, the concept of the selfish gene. And so what he meant by that was very much, uh, it, it was a, just a beautiful way of, of illustrating that what genes are good at doing is making stuff that enables them to be better at the job of creating copies of themselves in future generations. Mm -hmm. so, so fundamentally, that's what it means for genes to be selfish, is that they're good at doing things that ra raise their rates of, of, of replication. Yeah, and what's, what's important and novel about that is, is that it was an important maybe revision is too strong a word, but an important addition to the Darwinian theory of evolution, which in Darwin's time, we didn't know that there were such things as genes. And there was a view that the unit on which natural selection operates is the individual. And that, that introduced the obvious problem, perhaps the not so obvious problem, but, but the problem of why aren't people simply selfish all the time. And can you, t so can you talk about how, how the genes I view could possibly help explain that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the really unfortunate things that, um, uh, Richard has had to live with for 45 years, 44 years. Um, when you talk about genes as selfish and you sit, you know, you, you kind of try to, alienate people from themselves a little bit just so they can see how marvelous evolution is. And you present this view of that, of genes as having these kind of selfish effects. It tempts you to come to the conclusion that, well, people must be selfish all the way down. If, if what genes do is build bodies that, you know, um, have the effect of causing in, in, you know, the genes to have higher reproductive success, then it must build individuals who are just out there trying to grab every bit of food they can and knocking rivals out of the way and, you know, poisoning their enemies and, you know, uh, you know, poisoning their stepfathers or whatever it is they're doing. Um, but this is, this is, um, that's a misleading conclusion to draw because what actually all that means is of the possible infinity of behaviors you might engage in, the behaviors that we'll have on the menu as things we will be inclined to do are things that over the long haul of a full life end up leading to higher reproductive success. So what we can do is start to think like economists. You know, once we say, People will have minds that incline them to do things that make them better off, you know, make them better off in the, in the, in the game of reproductive success. Then you can start to say, hmm, well, the gains of trade 
are something that make people better off. You know, it's, you don't have to just simply be devoted to trying to kill everybody. You know, you can say, hmm, there, it, it seems like, you know, an organism might be better off if it could, if it could figure out how to uh, make things that other individuals wanted and um, buy things, you know, for other individuals that they don't feel like making themselves. Then you can say, hmm, well, it seems like these creatures could, could understand trade. Or you could make organisms that could understand reciprocity. Um, or you could make organisms that care about their loved ones and their families. And in fact, natural selection has done that a lot. It's built design into um, lots of organisms that cause them to care about their offspring. And that's, that seems sort of obvious. You know, like, well, of course, every animal cares about its offspring. But you, you have to build that in. You have to build that kind of concern for others into the bodies and minds of these evolving creatures. So just as a fundamental step, if you're going to have individuals that care for their offspring, you have to build in instincts. And you can see where those instincts could be built by selfish genes. You know, selfish genes that cause organisms to take concern for their, their children would be genes that are better off. So they build care, they build concern, they, bear, they, they create parental love. So almost as soon as you're social, you know, once, as soon as you are, you know, an organism that um, produces young that require a lot of care, you're going to get, con cons you're going to get unselfishness as a product of these selfish genes. Yeah. And the key link there is that the gene inside me, you know, the gene inside me benefits if it makes me the type of person that cares about my sister and my children, if I had any, because there's likely to be a copy of that same gene in them that yeah that's right and and this is the huge and and this is where the genes stay selfish i mean one of one of the great insights and and this is really what um richard uh, dawkins has motivated him to write the selfish gene he'd come across um a couple of early papers by uh i mean not so early it was just a couple of years you know a few years before dawkins was working on the book but uh by uh, a biologist named bill hamilton who's gone now but what Hamilton had to say was, imagine you're a gene. You don't care what individual's gonads you're locked in. It doesn't matter. What matters to you is how many copies you can get out into the world. And the more copies of yourself you can manage to get out into the world, the more copies there will be of you in the world, and they will have the same propensities you do. So the genius, uh, uh, Hamilton's genius was to say, hmm, there aren't just copy in Mike McCullough. There aren't just copies of my of Mike McCullough's genes in Mike McCullough. There are copies of Mike McCullough's genes in his offspring, you know, his offspring or his siblings or his cousins or second cousins. So I, Mike McCullough might have a gene that causes him to behave in a way that benefits those other individuals at a cost to Mike McCullough. But in so doing, if it's a really valuable benefit to those other individuals, even if really costly to Mike, that gene can still go up in frequency or in, or in uh, its representation in the population if by helping those under, other individuals who bear the genes, at the end of the generation, there are more copies out there. So a rare gene in me is uh, likely to, you know, 50-50 likely to be in one of my, my siblings. So if I'm able to do something really valuable for that sibling, even if it's at a cost to me, at the end of us all doing our reproducing, you know, having all of our kids, there may be more copies of that gene in the world. And if so, that's a gene that's on the move. And that's a gene that's got a, a future. And what the future it will have is motivating individuals to provide benefits to their relatives, even if it comes at a cost to them. And that's a gene mm -hmm. that can take over the population. Mm -hmm. So the gene doesn't care whose body it's in. And that was one of the um, you know, amazing insights that we only got in the 1960s. I mean, that's not that long ago, you know, but that's the evolution of care. Like that, that's, that's the fun. That's the first place we see individuals, you know, really beginning to care about. We, we get biological design psychology, if you like, that, that enables individuals to take a concern for the welfare of other individuals. It's through relatedness. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, so the 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 Dawkins selfish gene um, innovation helps explain why we why it's a human universal to be kind towards your family and towards your offspring. 
But then there's this separate question, which is really the focus of your book, which is why would primates such as ourselves, so constructed, be kind to strangers? Why, why do I very occasionally in New York when I'm in the mood give a dollar to the person begging when that person is clearly not my family? Why do people routinely donate to charity, uh, donate to charities that are working in places that are so far away that they're almost abstractions? And you, you, you sort of start out by looking at some of the explanations within Evolutionary, evolutionary psychology. And there are two that you highlight uh, and, and sort of explain as, as both inadequate, but, but they're useful to think about just to grab onto the evolutionary psycho psychological way of thinking. And those are the stranger adaptionist uh, model and the blessed mistake model. So could you explain those two? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's generally, uh, you know, a lot of social scientists uh, and biologists are are interested in where niceness comes from. You know, uh, I mean, clearly we've got this kinship thing going on. This thing, this Hamilton thing that I talked about. Um, we've got some some other theorists. Um, it's a, it's a, all to say this is a uh, sociality is is a huge part of evolutionary biology, and so evolution, evolutionary social scientists have taken an interest in it as well. And in general, they've fallen into two schools to explain why do we care about strangers? Why do we why do we tip in restaurants we'll never visit again, or when we go to a conference and we're going to be going to a cafe where we'll never benefit you know benefit from having helped somebody? Why do we leave a tip? Um, why do we do all these things towards strangers that we seem to get no benefit from? And there's, as I size it up, there's two camps. There are groups of of theorists who say no, 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 we do we have evolved to take an interest in the welfare of strangers. And we can just look back into um, the history of human demography and look at how groups were structured. And we can see ways in which there were strangers in our midst that would have generated a payoff to us to have a genuine abiding intrinsic care for. So I call them stranger adaptationists. Um, I, I think, well, I'll move on to the second one. Um, the, 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 second, um, the second group of people, and Dawkins is really at the vanguard of them, um, I, I, I refer to as blessed mistakers. And, and this is a term I actually got from Dawkins in, um, in uh, one of his latter, more recent books. He was trying to give people a sense for why we do care about strangers. And he compared it to uh, something like sexual desire, where he says, um, you know, sexual desire clearly exists for the purpose of facilitating reproduction. Um, but today we can know that fact and know that we don't want to have children. And um, nevertheless, we, we still continue to have a desire to have sex and to have a mate. Um, so, um, even though the passion is still there, we don't necessarily need to, um, you know, it, it can, it can motivate behavior in under situations in which there's no hope of it fulfilling its end goal, which is to cause us to have, you know, to, to have offspring. So he, he, he says that we can have the same concern for others around us, even if there's no chance of us getting a benefit from helping them, um, because our the psychology that motivates us to care about others evolved in a world in which caring for others ended up meaning caring for your friends or your family, because an other the people that you would encounter that you lived among were people who cared about you, and so. Any random person you just grabbed out of the universe of people you knew and decided to help was going to be somebody you knew. So why would natural selection bother making that system any smarter than that? You know, mm. you can imagine in a world where you essentially know everybody, you know, everybody's in your contact list that you're ever going to run across. Natural selection could just say like, hey, any, when you come across, help them, you know. So to help people today, 
is a blessed mistake. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a lovely thing. It makes the world a better place, but we're not doing it because we care about the welfare of strangers. We do, we're, do, we're doing it because our minds have this rule of thumb that says, if you see it and it's needy, help it. Hmm. Because in a world in which that sentiment involved, that would make the individual better off. So I have some reasons to think that that is a, an incomplete um, explanation as well. Um, but those are the two kind of alternatives on offer that uh, I was trying to steer between because I didn't find either of them very, you know, completely satisfying. So in some ways, my book is really about trying to steer a different way forward to understand. The book started out as uh, the, the provisional title was why we don't give a damn because I didn't realize how fun it would be to write about why we do give a damn. Um, but ultimately, it's why we give a damn about strangers. And I don't think either of those two, um, you know, sort of alternatives really get the job done. So um, let's move on. I think we could we could dwell more on evolutionary psychology. And there is actually one thing I, I do want to dwell uh, about, which is, as you said, ultimately, um, the pr probably the majority of your book is is not about really about evolutionary psych, but about the historical and you know sociological and cultural and economic reasons why we've grown so much more generous over the past several hundred years, as measured by things like you know, how much, what percentage of GDP goes to social spending and whatnot. But I do want to address one common critique of evolutionary psychology before we get there, which is the no notion that evolutionary psychologists are telling just so stories, that they're really working backward from a conclusion and, and they're working backward from their baseline hypothesis, which is that, you know, our, our minds are shaped by evolution and you can see the, the imprint of evolution in our behavior today. And they just take that for granted. And then whatever behavior they see today, empirically, they tell a convenient story about why that would have made sense evolutionarily. So it's not really a science. It's not making predictions and, and so on. So I'm sure you've heard that. Do, do you, what's your reply to that? Sure. I mean, that's, this is a really common um, critique. And I, I think uh, there was a time in which uh, it, it, was a, it was a fair critique. In fact, I think today still, that's a fair critique to make about some of evolutionary psychology. Um, like any field, the quality of the work is not uniform. Like any field, there are people who um, are doing top quality work, and there are people who's you know maybe maybe is not their work is not top quality. Um, so, like you know, in in any field or any endeavor of human life, it's you know if you enjoy you know dealing in black and white you know blanket statements, then you can do the same thing in Ev Psych, but. Um, I think more and more that that critique is is um, uh, an unfair and inaccurate one, because evolutionary psychologists have learned that for any behavior you see, you have to realize that there is more than one evolutionary hypothesis for it. So you there could be a, a number of reasons uh, that natural selection might have put together a particular psychological system. So the goal is generally not to tell a just so story, but it's to test a number of possible stories. And as we do in psychology, as we do in science in general, try to knock down the bad ones and then be left with the ones that are good. So um, it's a, it's, an effort to rule out bad ideas, you know, just like one would do in, in any field of science. Um, the, the, the difference I think is 
um, what we want to see and increasingly what we are seeing is um, forward-looking predictive power where we can predict new phenomena on the basis of basic evolutionary theorizing. So um, I, think, I think a great example, uh, it's just, it's one of my favorite examples of bringing the predictive power of natural selection thinking to understanding human behavior actually goes back to kinship and figuring out how it is we come to learn who our siblings are. This is work by uh, one of my friends and former colleagues, uh, Deb Lieber, Deborah Lieberman. The question was, how do we figure out who our offspring are? Or pardon me, how do we figure out who our siblings are? You can say on one hand, like, well, what a dumb question. People tell us who our brothers and sisters are. You live with them. But again, you don't get anything for free psychologically. Something had to create the system that we use. And what, what Lieberman figured out is um, it may be that we use um, the amount of time we live with somebody as offspring, as, as children, and there's a little odometer, odometer in our heads that just counts the number of days that we live under the same roof with somebody. And our minds just count up days. Um, and uh, that's a pretty good heuristic you might use. Um, but for older siblings, there's another thing you could use, which is whether you saw your mom care for the younger child. Okay, so imagine you're an older sibling. You see, up, um, you see your mom breastfeed your your dumb, you know, dumb little brother, and um, you can use this cue to lock in a sense like, "Yep, that's my sibling." What Lieberman found, and I think this is just genius. You've got those two cues available. Older siblings can see mom caring for younger. Younger can't see mom caring for older because there's because the age gap is different. Lieberman predicted that the amount of, cons amount of sort of uh, compassion and concern and willing to help your sibling, your older sibling, um, that would be, uh, pardon me let, me, let me start that sentence over. Um, she wanted to know how long would you have to live with an older sibling in order to feel the same care and love for them that your older sibling would feel for you, given the fact that your older sibling had this really rock solid cue because they saw mom taking care of you. Mom's taking care of that one, that, and I know that's my mom, then that's probably my sibling. Turns out for that younger sibling, 15 years, and you get to the same amount of concern that the older sibling has for the younger sibling. Hmm. Why is 15 years good? Because that's about the amount of time that children in the environment we grew up with would have been under the same roof with an older sibling before, before that older sibling took off and started trying to make a way for itself, for himself, herself. So 15 years, once you get to 15 years of living together, that's when that fellow feeling, you know, that feeling of commitment and, you know, brotherly, sisterly love sort of reaches its, its peak. And older siblings get there right away. So the entire ecology of our lives together as children tells us that 15 years is a kind of a magic number. And by the time you get to 15 years, that's, that's where, uh, you know, 15 years of living together is where sort of uh, um, fraternal love reaches its peak. That's a power, excuse me, that's a powerful prediction that no one has ever made, ever thought to make about how we come to care about our brothers and sisters. And there it is, first principles, knowing what we know about what human life was like before we were modern, before we were living in cities, knowing that natural selection makes good stuff that does its job right, that it doesn't like us to make mistakes, it doesn't want you treating complete strangers like siblings. Um, and no, you know, this, these are discoveries that no one had even thought to ask the questions about and wouldn't have if they hadn't been thinking about the mind as this tool designed by natural selection to get jobs done. Yeah. So you, so you work with what you know. We know a lot about what our human history was like. We know that we get certain jobs done. And so an evolutionary psychologist says, like, let's figure out how it works. Novel predictions. Yep. So I want to move on now from evolutionary psychology. And because I think one of the... Uh, the, the kind of mo motivation for the structure of your book is that evolutionary psychology, it tells us 
what human beings have in common and why we have it in common and what separates us from other animals psychologically in terms of our broad tendencies. What it doesn't, what it can't by definition tell us is why societies have changed psychologically over short periods of time. Why is the the typical American today is a very different person than the typical American in 1750. And Evo Psych operating on long timelines can't, probably can't tell us very much about why that is. We have to look to other disciplines like history and sociology and, and so on and so forth. And the second, second half of your book is spent explaining this puzzle, the sort of long-term historical trend line towards greater kindness towards strangers, where right now we're spending something like 20% of, of GDP on social spending up from virtually zero, you know, a few hundred years ago. And you go even further back. So can you sort of sketch in broad historical terms what the evolution of kindness has been like, not on the evolutionary time scale? Yeah, yeah. It is uh, a strange thing to imagine a world in which we didn't have a social safety net, uh, in which um, the only um, the only insurance policies you had were family and friends and you know whatever fat you could store on your bodies for when you know when you were going to be hungry but but that's the state of nature the state of nature is friends family and fat so what seems to have happened as humans became sedentary and we stopped living as you know egalitarian hunter gatherers um, is that we find ourselves in set, settling down in cities that become larger and larger and have more and more people and um, um, our economic life becomes more and more specialized. And we find ourselves in cities in which um, it really becomes uh, possible through the accumulation of bad luck to end up with very bad luck indeed uh, over the course of multiple, you know, multiple, you know, generations. Um, if, if you have a bad harvest, you end up with a bad piece of land or you have the, you know, the cattle die, you know, that's bad luck that could reverberate for centuries through your lineage. Likewise, if you have good luck, then you're going to, you're going to pass on more, you know, good luck to you, to your offspring. So we see the, um, see kind of an explosion of inequality in these earliest, you know, these earliest city states, uh, in the archaic world. Um, this was the first time anyone thought to care about the welfare of complete strangers um, in, um, well, they'd thought to care about them before that, but the way they thought to care for complete strangers was just killing them. You know, our, our relationship to absolute strangers, um, we, we did have a relationship to them in the, you know, uh, in the pre-state world, but that was a, 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 you know, that was a relationship of like, let's kill as many of them as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, we move into a period of indifference once we start start to settle into cities where we can coexist with people we don't care about. But pretty much right away, there these, this starts to the suffering of strangers starts to generate second order problems. Um, cities are not fun if um, there are people dying in the streets of exposure or disease. Cities are not fun if people are walking around um, not able to uh, make their, meet their own daily caloric needs, um, and so. What we have left over are legal codes from the ancient, you know, cities, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sumeria and Mesopotamia, telling us that the poor were regarded as requiring, needing a special kind of consideration just to prevent um, vast amounts of exploitation. So, um, the idea that poverty creates second-order problems, I think, is the fundamental first you know you know motivating engine conceptual engine for why societies begin to take an interest in the welfare of complete strangers it's because they're here they're here with us we got to we got to figure out what to do about this because of the second order problems so i see human history over about 10,000 years being a history of 
looking at second order problems on a variety of scales or in a variety of denominations and asking, you know, what are, you know, how do we want to as corporately cope with these, these second order problems? Some of the second order problems are really material. They're really basic problems like epidemics, not fun. You know, um, it's bad for morale to see people dying in the streets. It's bad for business, you know, very, very material second order problems. But then what I, I think I've seen uh, through history as well is that some of the second order problems become problems of meaning or ethics. Like, I just don't like seeing what's happening here. It's violating certain ethical or spiritual or moral principles I have. So how do I want to deal with those, those second order problems as well? So to me, I see an inventive species where people, as strangers are stuck with strangers, generating by, uh, consequences for them and then trying to figure out how best to handle those, those, those second order consequences. In the, in the context of your book, I found one of the passages really interesting about the golden rule. And um, when we're thinking on such long timescales, going back to hunter-gatherers all the way up to today, it becomes interesting to notice that several different societies came up with some version of the golden rule within the same, you know, two to 500 year period. And then you begin to wonder whether there were structural, you know, the structural changes that were going on around the world in agricultural societies at that time didn't lend themselves to such a rule. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. It, it's a, it, it's the oddest thing. I mean, you, ha- you know, you know, you see, you see the notion of, you know, something like that which is evil to you do not visit on others. You know, um, do un, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Maybe you know more in the positive frame, um, popping up in uh, axial age Judaism and uh, you know Yellow Valley Chinese religion and Indus Valley you know, Indic religion, um, you know, it comes up in, in Buddhism and Confucianism later in Christianity and Islam, obviously. Um, but this golden rule, it, it just appears seemingly out of nowhere in all of these places. You have to, I mean, you have to assume they were all getting it from the same source, but that's lost to time. If, if that's the case, instead, what we're left with is that perhaps there were, you know, as, you know, as, uh, societies became, um, again, ever larger, and uh, war became ever more effective and uh, more nasty on a larger scale. Um, people started to, um, you know, ask really deep ethical questions about what the meaning of life was, and um, it looks like the solution they came to in all of these societies was that. Uh, you know, a meaningful life or a spiritual life or a life, you know, of, of, of fulfillment needed to be a life of compassion. Um, the, the assumption is that they wouldn't have come to this conclusion if it hadn't been for, you know, wars having become so bloody and leaving so many bodies um, and, and having a sense that um, just the existing religious systems couldn't, ex- couldn't explain this. So you do, you get the evolution of compassion, the, uh, you know, the emergence of compassion as a spiritual mandate, really for the first time. I mean, it's weird to think like people have always been religious, but the idea that the essence of religion was compassion, like that would have sounded really weird prior to the axial age, but it starts, you know, now we, we hear it and it sounds just, you know, it sounds second nature. It's hard to, you know, imagine a world religion that would try to distance itself from that idea. But it was an innovation. It came from somewhere. There was a time in which that was an absurd thing to say, and now we just it, we just it's hard, it's hard to imagine otherwise. Mm. So that's the golden rule coming out of, seemingly coming out of nowhere. So as you move on in the book, you, you spend a good deal of time talking about the past, say, three hundred years, uh, and the evolution of kindness to strangers as manifested in the welfare state. So can you tell that story and, and sort of connect it to the broader themes of this conversation? Yeah, yeah. The welfare state <clears throat> is something you start to see. Um, 
you see a hint of this in um, the writings of the late 18th century um, and then com coming through, I think, th three thinkers, um, Rousseau, Kant, and Adam Smith, who all gave rise to the idea that um, there was a fundamental human dignity that even the poor had. I mean, you could, this is you know, a collection of ideas that I think get put together into a notion of distributive justice. Um, right about the turn of, you know, the, the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s. Um, there's a fundamental human dignity. Um, and as a result of that, we owe a certain duty to each other to be, to treat each other in an ethical way. That's Kant. From Smith, we get the idea that everyone has worth, everyone has a genius, um, and markets are great, but they require some regulation in a couple of really set sensitive tender areas of human life which are education and the and actually the job market and then from Rousseau, you get this notion of inequality um which you know does as a as an empirical fact seem to have you know um we we can see it cropping up in the very first uh sedentary uh societies um and his notion that that inequality is is something that has a kind of multi-generational um uh, dynamic behind it these all get put into an idea of distributive justice, which you know is um, becomes really something, you know, au courant around the time of the French Revolution. Um, but this fundamental human dignity idea sticks, and as that idea makes its way through a lot of nineteenth-century minds. We reach the end of the 19th century. People are getting rich. They're starting to get rich. Life is starting to get a lot better as we enter the industrial age. Welfare is increasing. Uh, wages are increasing. People are leaving the countryside in droves for the opportunity to work in the dark satanic mills of the industrial age because that's, that's how you get comfortable. That's how you develop a life for yourself where, you know, you can feed a family and be comfortable. Um, it's leaving the country for the places where the jobs are. Um, so um, by the end of the, you know, by the second half of the 19th century, um, what um, England, Germany, Austria, you know, what Poland, what the large industry, you know, the large country, you know, industry, engines of industry were realizing is, you know, we've got all these folks here. Um, if we can create some basic, since we've pulled them away from their families, which is what they essentially relied upon as kind of insurance policies, there's, you know, social insurance policies. We've all moved here into the cities. If, if we can make some provisions for them so that, you know, if they're too sick to work, you know, they're not going to end up out on the streets or they're too old to work or they're too disabled to work. If we can begin to put some, 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 um, some social insurance is in place to hedge people against these slings and arrows of life, um, then we can prevent more second order problems. You know, we can prevent the situation where no one has, has, you know, these folks have got another 20 years of life to live, but they don't have any money to live it with. So um, it, life is good. It becomes pox, possible to tax because um, prosperity is high. And what you see happening in a lot of different countries around the same amount of time, 1890s to the, to the teen, eight, 19 teens, is the addition of um, social insurances. The first ones showing up, Germany and Poland, disability insurance for workers, uh, illness insurance for workers. And gradually, these innovations just diffuse through 20, 30 nations really quickly, like in a matter of decades. And every society in Western Europe um, has a program for disability insurance or illness insurance or old age pensions. Um, and so what, what we see is through a matter of just cultural copying, I think, um, all of these societies sort of realizing, hey, this is a way to ensure like the workforce stays healthy and intact. And we're not leaving people destitute just because they, you know, 
died 10 years before the actuarial tables, you know, said they ought to die. Um, uh, so the welfare state starts with these basic social insurances. We get to World War I and the Great Depression. This is seen as an opportunity to extend those programs even further. And so all through Europe, obviously North America as well, and all the English speaking countries, you see an accumulation. And the programs just expand. Universal education. Uh, there's not any place in the world now where you wouldn't imagine that being something you'd, you'd want as a social good. Everyone has it now. Um, some sort of social security program, old age pensions. They're just everywhere now. Um, and essentially every possible benefit that we can imagine providing as a way of uh, establishing a kind of basic level of, of wellness or w welfare, um, somebody has experimented with and tried to put in place. Um, um, and following World War II, it was possible to raise so much income, you know, for the war effort that tax rates stayed hot, very high for a long, long time. And, you know, through into the Johnson administration, we were able to continue to, to experiment with ways to, you know, social security and, and other things to try to keep people out of poverty. Mm. So it's creeped in this kind of tentacular way um, and, and gone from, as you say, you know, um, from a time when we, you know, the, the, the rate of you know, the uh, percent of GDP spent on social spending was zero to a place now where it's 20 plus percent everywhere, including in the United States. So this, is, this will be my, my final question. Um, but I think, I, I think people listening to this might feel that there's a kind of schizophrenia to the conversation uh, because, you know, the whole first half is spent talking about evolutionary psychology and the way in which we, we didn't really dwell on this, but the, the way in which it limits our capacity for empathy and for kind kindness to strangers where it, yes, however, however we get there, it's possible to feel empathy for people, but we should bet very much, much against the possibility of, you know, being able to raise a whole generation to care just as much about strangers about th th than they do um, themselves, you know, just the, the mere fact that I can be selfish enough to do this podcast that I enjoy rather than spending every moment of my time figuring out how to help others, you know, there's, ju there's just this casual level of selfishness and, you know, uh, attention on ourselves that you point out in the book that we're, we're not even aware of. And we take for granted that we don't realize how, how far we are from you know, being the picture of a, a saint or someone who is truly caring about others. And that's just baked into our psychology. There's, there's really no fundamentally, there's no reinventing ourselves. Uh, that's not on the menu. But at the same time, you see this almost inexorable trend throughout history towards caring more and more about strangers. So how do you, how do you resolve those two facts. Yeah. Yeah. I actually don't think empathy's done a whole lot of the work uh, through history of bringing us to where we are now. I mean, there are, we have emotions, we have care, we have concern, we pity others, we feel sorry. I don't think those kinds of, uh, you know, human warm sentiments have, have driven a lot of the action we've seen over the past 500 years. I think the evolutionary endowments that have done the work for us are the endowments that allow us to look around our lives and see things we don't like. I mean, this is, it's, it's so fundamental. It almost sounds stupid to even put words to it, but I really do think these are the instincts that have done the work. You look around you, you see conditions you don't like, and We've all, we do this all the time. And then we say, well, what are our options for addressing these issues? You know, what are, we can find our incentives. And then like many animals can do, we can see pathways to, um, that will, that will allow us to track those incentives and, and, and obtain them. Um, for human beings, these are, we, what we've done is we've tried to find our incentives at the societal level. So great. We, um, you know, business, it would be better for business. It would be make for a more competitive country if 
we had a healthy workforce rather than a destitute workforce, that's a problem. Let's have a conversation about how we want to deal with that. So what I actually see through history is people using reason, seeing conditions that they don't like, finding through science, perhaps, that certain, certain, you know, certain conditions are bad for business. They're bad for flourishing. They're bad, for, you know, they um, cut against certain ethical principles we value. And then getting together for debate and argument, actually. What should the tax rate be? You know, what's the, what's the right tax rate? You know, which of these programs work? You know, which of them create more problems than they solve? Which of them disincent, you know, incentivize all the wrong things? Like, these are arguments. And we've, you know, as I look through the long course of history, it's not people saying, like, Let's love one another. Let's remember that everybody, you know, um, let's remember, you know, that all you need is love or something to solve problems. It's been fine. Okay. What's the right amount at which to do this? You know, what's the right amount we should spend on this? Does this thing work or not? So it's through, only through vigorous reasoning and argumentation that we've managed, I think, to make a dent in most of these social problems. You know? How much should we be sending to developing countries around the world? Isn't that money just going to end up in the hands of dictators? You know, isn't that money just going to be converted into bribes and it's not going to improve anybody's lives at all? Like these are real arguments. And I think this is where the engine of history has been in helping us to become more com compassionate as, a, you know, as a society, as a world. Hmm. Yeah. And that's one thing that's sometimes overlooked when talking about Evo Psych is that reason is one of the things that we are built to be capable of. That's, that's right. We are built to reason and we reason in groups. That's, you know, we talk a lot about the biases and, um, you know, myopias that humans have in their decision making. And we do. But a lot of those myopias and biases fall away when you have to, 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 to argue your case among other people. So the mm -hmm. other people are looking at your case and saying, well, I assume this, that what this guy's going to say is stupid. So let me just hear it through. And let me, let me see the, let me find the flaws. Let me do him the favor of finding the flaws in his reasoning. Hmm. So we, 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 we engage in, um, you know, conjecture and refutation. And that's what sharpens arguments. You know, if I just walk around with arguments in my head, they're bound to be terrible arguments because I can't argue well with myself. Hmm. But when we reason together, we can end up with increasingly better arguments. So I think that's what's been happening. And we have, we have instincts for this. This doesn't come naturally either. We evolved to try to figure out collective problems together. Which way did the deer go? You know, let's look at the tracks and use our expertise and try to figure it out. Everyone can have really different ideas about the answer to that. But at the end of the day, everybody wants to find the deer. Everybody wants to be correct. So through argument, you can get rid of the bad arguments and hopefully leave the good ones standing. Well, on that optimistic note, uh, thank you so much, Michael McCullough. The book is uh, The Kindness of Strangers. And we we only really scratched the surface of it in this conversation. So I encourage you to all go out and buy it and um, get beneath the surface. But it's been uh, a pleasure to talk to you. Can you point uh, listeners in the direction of any online home that you have, or if not, a, perhaps a Twitter handle? Sure. Uh, I'm M-E underscore McCullough on Twitter. Um, and I'm on the UCSD website. Um, that's an easy place to find me in the Department of Psychology. Um, and I also blog at socialscienceevolving.com. So those are probably the best three places to interact with me online. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Thanks, Coleman. It was really great talking with you.